Welcome back to the Artie Lang Show. Our next guest uh, wrote a real fascinating book called <laughs> Dr. Feelgood. The shocking story of the doctor who may have changed history by treating and drugging JFK, Marilyn, Elvis, and other prominent figures. Uh, it's a book about this guy, Dr. Max... Uh, uh, what's Jacobson. Uh, Jacobson. Max Jacobson. And he basically uh, discovered... Uh, the, the joys, if you will, of methamphetamine and uh, devised this concoction that he shot people up with, a lot of famous people, well-known people, and they became addicted to it because it, it got them high. They were high on meth and got a lot done because uh, that's what you do. And he wrote a book about this guy and how he uh, changed history, and it's fascinating. Uh, I want to welcome William J. Burns to the show. Thank you, sir. How are you, William? I'm good. Now, we were talking to you a little bit before the show. You're a fascinating guy. Your, your godfather is George Burns. Right. My father and George Burns started in show business together back at the, in the early 20th century, turn right. of the century. They were these two little kids, right? And they wanted to go dancing in all the Irish bars on the Lower East Side. Right. But their names were Birnbaum, Nathan Birnbaum with George Burns. <laughs> and my father was A.B. Kaplan. Right. So the bartenders would beat them out of the bars. Get out of here. You know, uh, you know one of those things. So they changed. So in New York City... In the early 20th century, all the tenements on the Lower East Side were heated with coal. Right. And the coal truck was called the Burns Brothers Coal Company. Okay. And all the kids would run after the coal truck because the tenements, you know, they couldn't afford coal. These were right. poor people, right? So they would stuff coal in the pockets of their father's overcoats. They looked wow. like Sweepy from Popeye, right? Wow. They're running along the street in Lower East Tomskin Square right. Park, right, mm -hmm. with coal stuck in. So the kids in the neighborhood call, "Hey, you're the Burns brothers," you're the... and that was the name they took for their first act. Do you know how fascinating that is? Uh, the, the whole uh, idea of the Lower East Side and everybody who, everybody who came out of the Lower East Side in the early 20th century, like people born right around 1900 who grew up on the Lower East Side, George Burns, Al Capone. Uh, you know, all the gangsters, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Bugsy Siegel, and uh, they all came, it seems like they all came out of the same area. Like, what was it about the Lower East Side? Italians, Jews, Irish, everybody living together, and, and it created all this creativity and, you know. Well, that was the whole point. It's like living in a pressure cooker. Yeah. You had all these people packed into this small neighborhood, right? right? You had, they didn't speak English. Right. And it was the other thing, too. Nobody spoke, yeah, the Irish spoke English, kind of, but nobody really spoke English. And so you had these little micro communities, and there were no social services, right. conservative, liberal, you know, to deal with these immigrants. So they had to make their own way, right? So you had Myra Lansky and Benny Siegel, friendly with Lucky Luciano, and right. you know, Murder Incorporated. You had a lot of show business people coming out of the Lower East Side of New York. George Burns, yeah. my father. Yeah. So I mean. That was a microcosm, but it was that pressure cooker. So when they burst out of that neighborhood, they were like superstars. Absolutely. And another guy born in that era, uh, born in 1900, is a guy named Dr. Max Jacobson. And 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 the reason I, I, I stress where he was born, it's such perfect timing for him to affect the world. Because he went out into the 20th century and everything happened in the 20th century. Radio, television, people became famous from movies. Uh, in 1900, Hollywood it was, it was just a town. It was an orange grove. Everything happened in the 20th century. And this guy invents this thing, or, or discovers it around when? 1930-something? He's like, discovering this thing in the 1920s. Okay. Right? And because he has this brilliant idea. And it is a brilliant idea. You have all these surgeons in these hospitals in Berlin, in Europe, in the 1920s. Right. He was born right? in Europe. Yeah, he's from he's born, Germany. Yeah, he, yeah he, he's born in Fordham, Poland, and his father and his family moves to Berlin. So all these surgeons in these hospitals are not using any antiseptics, antibiotics. None of the stuff was invented by then. And, and it's the kind of thing where, oh, the surgery was successful, too bad the patient died. I mean, that was literally the, you know, that was the attitude because they would die of infections. So this guy Jacobson figures, if I can cure people by, if I think the blood is the issue and I can cure people by treating their blood syndrome, then I won't have to go in and be a surgeon I can cure things like neuromuscular disease. Right. So he concocts this drug using eel cells and 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 pig bladders and 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 all these sheep gonads, right? right? Thinking if these rejuvenate animals, well maybe they'll rejuvenate humans. But the drugs have such a negative effect. I mean, he he's injecting himself, right? right. 
So he's, he's using himself as his own guinea pig. Self testing. That's, and yeah. he was advocating that all doctors should use themselves as their own guinea mm. pigs. That was that was his premise. That's right. why they pulled his license in New York State. <laughs> right. But not till the 70s. Yeah. Not till 1973. <laughs> yeah. But so he, in order to make people not react negatively to the drug, he starts adding methamphetamines. Okay. Okay. Gradually increasing the dosage. Until he's he's shooting somebody up with sheep gonads right. and eel cells, and the person <laughs> instead of falling over dead feels great. This is wonderful, and he's jumping around. Why it's the meth? Right. So the, the the methamphetamine counteracted what he concocted, so you could your body could deal with it. Not only deal with it, love it, and and get you high. He was, absolutely. Right. That's exactly that was that the, uh, that was the whole method. And the funny part about it was even people who were deathly ill, like JFK was deathly ill. He had Addison's disease. Okay, he's very sick. But you feel so good from the drug. Right. Who cares? Nothing about matters. Things? It doesn't matter so anymore. Everybody, everybody exactly. I tell that to people. Uh, I'm, I was a heroin addict. I mean, I still am. You always are. But uh, and I've done every type of drug. I've done amphetamines and um, uh, you know, in pill form mostly. And uh, it's unbelievable. People always say, "Why can a homeless person <laughs> or a bum, so-called bum?" Uh, sleep on 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 a broken beer bottle and be comfortable. Why? Because they're on heroin, <laughs> right, <laughs> or they're exactly. on crack, yeah. or they're or, or they're on on meth. Everything's fine. A, a broken beer bottle feels like a luxury bed. It's like everything's okay. So this guy starts shooting people up, and of course they want to keep going back to him because you're you're cooked immediately. Huh? It's not only habit forming because it's a behavior. It's chemically habit forming. Of course, that's yeah. the important part about it. You get a couple of shots of methamphetamines. The methamphetamine molecule mimics the molecule of dopamine, so it hits that pleasure center in you know in the so what heroin does part too. Of your brain. Same, exactly. yeah, right. same yeah. thing. Yeah. It hits that pleasure center, and the brain says, "Ooh, this is really good stuff," and it uptakes the dopamine. Right. Right. Eventually, the dopamine receptors in the brain become so inured to the drug that it takes more and more of that drug to produce the highs. You right. keep going back again and again for more injections. The problem is that the upper part of methamphetamine is hypergrandiosity. It's like a psychotic manic thing, right? The down is... Uh, the down is, you better believe you it. You in the pits. Yeah, it's, it's the epitome of crash. Depression, anxiety, everything. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so how does he introduce? And John, I know John read the book and wants to get into this, but uh, and I'm going to keep you for a few segments because I think you're please fascinating. Please enjoy. And you tell a great story. I enjoyed listening to you before. But how does how does he introduce this to the world? So, uh, he, 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 so what does he do now? He's got this great thing. What does he do? First of all, he's treating patients who are incurable from other diseases like multiple sclerosis, right? right? And he begins treating these patients, and very gradually, the artistic community in Berlin, this is Berlin in the very early 30s. This is before Kristallnacht, before the night before of the Before Hitler took over. Right. Yeah, right. So he started... Uh, Hitler had just taken over, but he wouldn't he he become Hitler. Right, 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 right. Rising right, power. Right. So, so, so this guy is treating people in the entertainment community, right? Artists and writers and the news of feel good, feeling good spreads, because this is a new drug, right? Right, right. Hitler starts coming in, right? And what happens is the Nazis are looking at all the Jewish doctors. They don't like the Jewish doctors, right? right? right, right. And they're looking at all the stuff, and the Nazis look at him and say, what's this formula you're using that's making all these people feel so great? Right. He gives them the formula. That becomes the drug that not only did the Nazis, the Wehrmacht, used throughout World War II wow. to keep the soldiers awake. Wow. The Japanese used it to keep the pilots awake. We used it, and Kamikaze. the British used it to keep the pilots awake, right? So it's immediate effect on the world. Like, um, and, 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 and global, like, and so, like, like it's so amazing. It, it, it's, it's changing the world immediately. Already history begins to change right. when he starts. And, 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 and even Adolf Hitler, his doctor, Alfred Morell, right. Alfred Morell, copies Max Jacobson's formula and is giving Hitler methamphetamines. So here's this this guy with this huge army at his disposal oh. who's hyper grandiose to begin with, who believes in like he's he's like sent by the gods, so to speak, right, right, to, right. to rule the world. Now he's high on meth. 
There's no stopping it. Hitler, stuff. I mean, think yeah. about it. It's like a joke. Hitler, imagine Hitler on meth. Well, yeah. Hitler on meth was Hitler. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. A guy yeah. like Hitler on meth. Right. I mean, he went to Poland. Everybody's like, calm down. Austria, Yugoslavia. No, imagine he might have needed some sleep without the stuff. Well, <laughs> and, think of Hitler invading Russia. Yeah, and everybody right. saying him, he actually you see, it affected his judgment. Right. And yes. the hero of Napoleon? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, you're right. He did a wrong thing. He took on Russia and us because of the drug, maybe, and it ruined them. Yeah. And remember, Hitler declared war on us. We never declared war on him. Oh, no, absolutely. Yeah. And Hitler was basically... The, the only reason Jacobson escaped Berlin is because one of the brown shirts tipped him off. It's a great story. One of the brown yeah. shirts told him, hey, you know, like, can you check me out? I need help. I have gonorrhea. I can't go to the the you know Regular the German doctor. doctors, yeah, yeah. The, the Hitler's doctors, and uh, he tipped him off that that. And then when he went back to Berlin, that where his practice actually had been was now a a bomb crater. Exactly. Well, then crystal, yeah. well, then crystal well. lock happens. So in other words, this guy that that's a great point. This guy, this brown shirt, this Nazi says, I got gonorrhea. Can you? Can you treat me on the down low? He treats him, and then he goes, you did me a favor. I'm going to do you a favor. He tells uh, Jacobson you're on a kill list. Yeah, get the get hell out, out of here. Yes. The next yes. day, Jacobson, Crystal Lock happens. His office is gone. He gets the hell out. He goes to Paris. Mm -hmm. Is that the first place he goes? No, he, no, he goes to Prague. Okay, Prague. goes right. to Prague. But here's what happens. This is, and this is the whole part of intrigue about this guy. He's in Vienna, and he's turned by the Soviet Union to be a Soviet operative. So here's this guy. He's high on his own drugs, right? He's high on his own meth. Right. He's fleeing Hitler, and he sees the Soviets as the counterpoise, as the counterbalance to Hitler. So he becomes a Soviet operative. He's in Paris. He becomes very famous. He's treating Billy Wilder, the great, you know, the great, right? Right. Okay. He, he's in Paris. Um, the, the clouds of war begin to gather. All the expats flee from Paris. To New York. Yeah, he had to get out of Paris right. pretty quick too. Eventually, yeah. you better believe yeah, it. Right. And he's in New York, and it's 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 the middle 1930s, and all the people he was treating in Paris and in Berlin are now in New York. But this guy is a Soviet operative. Mm. So oh, really? Yes, he's okay. turned by the Soviets. So the guy who becomes the doctor to JFK, keeping him high. And, you know, I think directly responsible for what happened in Vienna in 1961 when Khrushchev wow. rolled him over, wow. this guy's a Soviet operative. That's some, well, listen, yeah. a Soviet operative was helpful to us in World War II. That helped us because we were all just fighting Hitler. But by the time the Cold War came directly after, then you got you got some problems. Before yeah. the Vienna uh, summit, I guess, before the Vienna discussion with Nikita Khrushchev, his office in Manhattan was turned over, people assumed, by the KGB. Or, uh -huh. And so Nikita Khrushchev went into those discussions <laughs> armed with the knowledge that he was basically a druggie, that, right. he was, that he could be manipulated due to this addiction. Right. That's, so, the, other, that's the other thing drugs do to you. It, it makes you vulnerable. It makes oh, you vulnerable yeah, to, sure. ev to everything. It's something. So, and if someone has that on you, forget yeah. about it. Yeah. You know, I, it, it, uh, it changes your life. Yeah. So look at this. So the Soviets know that Kennedy is getting methamphetamine injections. Right. So they know this. But here's the counterpoise to Jacobson. So if you look at Jacobson's uh, FBI file and CIA file, the CIA and the FBI both know that Jacobson is dealing with the Soviets. They know this. It, it's in the record. Jacobson's other patient is a guy named Mark Shaw. Mm. Mark Shaw, remember those books of, you know, picture books of Audrey Hepburn and all these stars? And Mark Shaw is the photographer for that. Right, right, right. And he becomes the official Kennedy photographer. But Mark Shaw was OSS in World War II. He's a pilot. OSS in World War II. He becomes a non-official cover officer for the CIA. Wow. So look at the spy versus oh spy. My God. You got Jacobson injecting the president with <laughs> methamphetamines that Khrushchev knows about. What nobody knows about is that one of Jacobson's patients is a CIA non-official cover <laughs> it's officer called uh, Mark Shaw. Right. And the team, Mark the Shaw thing that, uh, died. Probably because of the injections he got, that yo, Jacobson was think? giving oh, her. Yeah, Jacobson, uh, Jacobson killed him. Well, you know, and again, what one thing do they have in common? The drug. It's, and the, you know, so now it really is fascinating. How does how does JFK get introduced to Jacobson? Uh, JFK is Senator Kennedy, mm -hmm. right? And there are two different stories. One story is that his roommate from Harvard, a guy named Chuck Spaulding, 
right, who's a good friend of Mark Shaw, the White House, uh, uh, the photographer for the Kennedy it's family. It's the Spalding family, the, the, ball, the, the one that make the, the basketball. This was yeah, yeah. Chuck Spalding. I, I, I remember hearing okay. that, yeah, that he was a roommate. So, yeah. It's Chuck Spalding, his roommate. He's a patient of Max Jacobson. Mm -hmm. So JFK is kind of dragging around. You know, he's, first of all, he had a fatal disease. Addison's disease. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize yeah, that. He, 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 he would not have bad, lived the yeah, bad back and everything. Disease. Yeah. He's on like five shots of Novocaine a day. Yeah. He's taking phenobarb because he has irritable bowel syndrome. Talk about, you know, Zurich, wow. right? Wow. <laughs> and and um, so he's got a whole bunch of other ailments. He's in constant pain. He's almost invalided. The guy walks on crutches when he's out of public view. Right. That's how bad it Man. is. Man. Right? He's when he was just still a senator, this is going on. Still yeah. a senator and friends with Richard Nixon in the Senate. Right. So story A, it's Chuck Spaulding who sees Kennedy's running through. He says, look, I, you know, I got to help you out. Go to the, I'm going to take you to Jacobson. So he actually takes Kennedy to Jacobson, makes the appointment. Kennedy walks in. He's hoarse. He's weak. Jacobson gives him one shot. Kennedy literally leaps out of his chair. He says, this is fabulous. Mm -hmm. Continues the campaign right before the first debate with Nixon. Right. And if you flash back, that October, flash back to that, Nixon is ahead in the polls. Right. And he is not only a rock'em, sock'em kind of guy, he wipes Helen Gagan Douglas off out of the campaign, right? right. Cold warrior, Whitaker Chambers, you name it, right? right. This guy's a, he's like, he makes Ted Cruz look like Mr. Rogers. That's, <laughs> that's how powerful Nixon is, right? Okay, so, so here's Nixon. He, he is about to meet Kennedy, and he is going to, he, he's like salivating to destroy Kennedy. Right. Kennedy loses his voice. So he loses his voice, he's in pain, he's sick, he's tired, and he can't walk. Drags himself to Jacobson. Jacobson gives him a 30 milligram methamphetamine shot. No. Oh. Right? <laughs> in his throat. Right in his <coughs> voice box. Oh, man. Kennedy bounds out tricks Nixon into not doing makeup while Kennedy does makeup, right. beats the stuffing out of this guy in the debate, right? The polls that night switch. Kennedy takes the lead, never loses the lead. Kennedy is so impressed with Jacobson. He says, I want you to be my, when's the election? I want you to be my doctor. Yeah. I want you on call all the time. And oh, by the way, Jackie has a migraine. And she's really, you know, oh, she can't even think. Come to Florida. And like treat Jackie, goes to Florida, gives Jackie an injection. Jackie Kennedy becomes a patient. So now he's got both these people literally be chemically hooked on a drug. And that's how he gets involved with Kennedy, Truman, and people like that. He becomes, he from show business, from writers like Truman Capote and... Um, uh, no, there's, there's nothing Capote was not uh, Tennessee Williams. Tony Andy Curtis, Miller. you sat in the air. And, uh, uh, Tennessee Miller. Williams. Uh, uh, Tony C. Curtis told us the most incredible story. He tells the story of, of he's dealing with, this is obviously before he dies, but Tony Curtis is dealing with Jacobson, right? Yeah. And he tells us the story of Marilyn Monroe on the set of Some Like It Hot. Right. And he's talking about how he's stripping Marilyn Monroe, and they're all high on methamphetamines because Marilyn got hooked back in the 50s right. by, from um, Lee Strasberg's wife, Paula Strasberg, at the <laughs> actress studio. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, uh, Tony Curtis, uh, what, what a life that guy had. <laughs> that guy was full of stories. But